Hello and welcome to Understanding Yourself Through MBTI, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. My name is Deborah Kane Sheffield. Have you ever wondered why some of your peers tend to dive into group projects, whereas you may prefer to wait and think about what the objectives are before you start on the work? Do you ever wonder why some of your friends and family and peers approach conflict a different way than you might, or how they may have different perceptions about what happened in that conflict than you may have had? Do you ever wonder why some people prefer to go out and be very social and go to parties on the weekend and seek people out, whereas others are perfectly happy staying home and reading? Well, these are some of the answers that can be provided by understanding your personality. The MBTI is a window into who you are and to who others are. Um, and so that's what we're gonna be doing in today's video. And this video has two objectives. First, you're going to be learning about what the MBTI is. What is the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator? What's its value to you? And how does it have practical application throughout your life, currently and in the future? Also, we'll be doing something called finding your best fit type, which is an exercise that MBTI practitioners do before they have their client actually take the MBTI instrument. So you're going to try to figure out and verify what you think your best type fit type is before you actually take the MBTI instrument. So again, my name is Deborah Kane Sheffield, and I'm an academic advisor in the Gloria S. Williams Advisement Center at William Patterson University. I also have a strong background in career counseling from William Patterson University. I am an adjunct professor in the communication department and in other departments, and I am very passionate about the MBTI and am certified to be an MBTI practitioner, which I've used in various areas of my life. And actually, I not a day goes by where I don't think about the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So let's kind of figure out why are we doing this? Why would someone want to find out more about their personality and how does this apply to you as a college student? Well, finding what our MBTI type is helps us to understand who we are. And without that foundation of understanding who we are and why we chose to attend college, it will be difficult for us to make goals for ourselves and to continue on toward those goals. So first to establish who we are would be finding out who our MBTI type is or what it is, which is one of 16 different possibilities. And then once we realize who we are, then we can help, that helps us to realize our goals. So what do I want to do with who I am? Where do I want to do it? Where will I be most satisfied and happy in my life? So before we start to embark on understanding the different components of the MBTI, it's good to have a little background. What is this and, and why is it valuable? And has it been studied? Well, yes, it has. MBTI has a long history. So it's originally based on the work of the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. It looks, the J is uh, pronounced yeah, so it's Carl Jung. And you might learn about Carl Jung in psychology classes, sometimes communication classes, anthropology and sociology. So the MBTI and the theorists involved can have applications through a wide variety of courses in the liberal arts. So Jung studied perception, how people perceive the world, how people make judgments upon what they see, and how people um, experience their flow of energy, whether outwardly or inwardly. And so then came along um, Isabel Briggs Myers and Catherine Cook Briggs, and that's how they came up with the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So they were fascinated by Young's work and expanded it and added more to it and used it to identify 16 patterns of personality. So the MBTI has actually be, been used since World War II, but it's gone through several um, iterations and of course it's computerized now. And it has been proven over and over to actually be a very valid instrument and reliable instrument. So it measures what it's supposed to measure. And also it's reliable, meaning that if you take the Myers-Briggs type indicator several times, there is a high chance that you're gonna have the same result over and over. So I use the MBTI in my daily life. And how do I do so is sometimes when I'm watching or when I'm observing interactions at say a work meeting 
or um, if I'm involved in a project and people are approaching that project differently, I try to reflect on like why they may be approaching that differently in terms of where uh, their different personalities. Um, sometimes I use it to analyze friendships and relationships, and I've even used it to help understand my own children better. So I use it in my daily life. And it's very interesting to understand where people are coming from based on the fact that they have different core um, personality traits. And so some other uses of the liberal arts awareness and advantage to having self-awareness through the MDTI is that it can help us with problem solving and decision making, working through conflicts and understanding where others are coming from in those conflicts. Um, encouraging people to, to speak and self-disclose and understanding why someone may choose to hold back and be, take more of a thoughtful approach before they decide to um, be in a conversation with others. It helps us to develop a respect for differences between people. So that's really important is that there are 16 different personality types with the MBTI and there's not one that's better than the other. Everybody has value in life. Everybody can add something valuable into any situation. So we need all those 16 personality types in different areas of our lives. So instead of um, looking down upon differences and, and, and having conflict and not understanding where people are coming from, if we have this basic understanding, we can appreciate others and their differences much more. MBTI is used in many areas. So sometimes human resources departments will use it in business settings and work settings to help um, work teams work better together. And sometimes they'll use it in classrooms to um, help in team development. It also can help you to understand what your learning style is as you take your classes and to understand the differences in teaching styles. So why do you feel like you click with some professors and not others? Why does it seem that when you go to some classes, the teaching style works better for your learning style than in other situations? And if we can understand someone's teaching style, it'll help us to reframe ourselves and our understanding for the, our learning style as well. And finally, um, when you take the Myers-Briggs type indicator as a college student, the results that will come back to you are going to help you to explore career, possible career paths and what careers your type tend to gravitate toward more than others and to help you to explore majors as well. So it has a lot of different uses and you're going to find yourself using it in the future well beyond majors and careers if you really click with the MBTI as I have. Before we get into the different personality preference pairs, I want to establish what MBTI type is and what type isn't. So it's really important um, to have a good understanding of why we use this and um, an appreciation of it and not to assume that um, the MBTI results mean something that they don't. So what type is, is that there are 16 possible patterns of personality based on preference pairs. So there are four sets of preference pairs and that results into co a combination of 16 possible personality types. MBTI is like handedness. So this is where I'm going to pause and throughout the video, I am gonna pause at certain points so you can go through an exercise. So what I want you to do right now is to take your pencil or pen and your paper, and I want you to sign your name the way you would normally sign it, the way it's most comfortable for you. And now that you've done that, put your writing utensil in your other hand and now try to sign your name with your less dominant hand. My guess is that it was a struggle to write your name, to sign your name with your less dominant hand. Could you do it if you had to? Of course you could. If something, God forbid, happened to your dominant hand, you could certainly have your less dominant hand take over. But is it as comfortable as natural as using your dominant hand? My guess is it's probably not. So that's what MBTI type is. We all exercise the different components of our preference pairs at any point in our life. So when I go through these, you're gonna say, well, I'm both this and I'm that. 
but we have one side that's a more comfortable fit for us than the other. Just like handedness, we can force ourselves to be something that's not natural to us. If we had to, we can play that part. And that's the same with our personality. If we have to be in a certain situation that we don't prefer and act a certain way, we sure can. And we've learned to do that. And we get better at that at different times in our lives as we grow older. However, we always kind of rest back on a most natural fit self. So it's just like if you had a house with 16 rooms, which would be very nice, right? So we have a 16 room house. Usually there's some place in your house that you go to where you feel most comfortable and natural and relaxed. So that's the same thing with an MBTI. We can go anywhere in our house. We could go to any of the 16 spots, but we always kind of go back to the one place where we just go and we take a deep breath and it's called our shoes off self where we're really comfortable. So that's what we're trying to find with the MBTI. We're not trying to find who we think we should be. We're trying to find who we naturally are because whoever we naturally are is, is our best self. And, our, and we always want to be our best, most natural self. So according to MBTI, type is never changing, but it does evolve through, a li through the lifespan. So we can grow to appreciate and understand our less dominant traits. Another thing about the MBTI that's fascinating is although it, it separates out into four different preference pairs and it gives us at the end a four letter code, the four letter code is greater than the sum of its parts. So it's not just these are the four things that we are because it measures four very specific things, but it argues that all together, they all interplay with each other and that it makes your personality so much greater than the sum of, of the parts of those four components. Also, type is one of many useful ways to understand yourself and others. It's not the end all be all to understanding your personality. There's many ways we can view people and others, but it's one window into who we are and who others are. Now that I've established what type is, it's very important to understand what type is not. We, that's a danger zone if we're gonna make assumptions. So we wanna make sure that we squash these myths about type. First, Type is not different based on who you are or who you are with. Sure, we can sometimes act a certain way that's less preferable to our, toward us. But remember, we're always gonna go back to that one room where we're most comfortable and it's our shoes off self. Type is not measured in quantity. So when, you say, when you're gonna look at the preference pairs in the next slide, you might say, well, I'm a little this and I'm a little that. So I think I'm somewhere in the middle. And that's a temptation, but according to the theory, type is usually one or the other. It's not a little bit of this or that. So you actually, it's difficult. It's called a forced choice test. So you are gonna have to choose between one or the other. One thing that's a danger with the Myers-Briggs is that when we get really into it and very excited about it, then we try to type everybody, right? And so we don't want to run into the danger of boxing people into categories because we understand that people are so much more than just a Myers-Briggs type. It's just one window into understanding others. It's also not a prescription for how you live your life or how you approach others. So when you take the actual instrument, which is after this session, um, you're going to get results back. And the result's going to tell you where, where a, those of your type tend to fall in terms of careers, what they tend to be gravitated towards. But that doesn't mean if you have a different career in mind that you shouldn't go toward that career. It's just more about self-reflection and introspection and understanding, okay, why is my type gravitated toward this career? And how can I make that my career, even if it's not listed here, more fulfilling for me? It's not always accurate. And that's why it takes two parts to really find out what your MBTI type is. So this is part one, verifying your type and finding your best fit type. And part two is actually taking the indicator. And so they may not match, but you have to figure out where, what, in what area, in what exercise, whether it was taking the actual instrument or doing this exercise today, which seemed to be a better example of who I am, which felt more natural, which felt more right as I was going through it. Finally, we should never say that type is a measure of intelligence. It has absolutely no bearing on intelligence whatsoever, and all types could be equally intelligent. Now that we've established what the history of MBTI is and how its uses in our daily lives, let's dive into the four different preference pairs. 
So you're going to be taking out your pen and paper. And as we go through each set of preference pairs, I'm going to pause and allow you to try to figure out and, and think about where you think you most naturally fall. It's important not to overthink it when we go through each pair. And it's important not to choose what we think people want us to be. It's very important to choose what we actually are. So you have to just think about yourself here and not who you think you should be, okay? So there's gonna be four letters that you're gonna come up with by the end. An E for extroversion or an I for introversion an S for sensing or an N for intuition because they already use the I for introversion, a T for thinking or an F for feeling, a J for judgment and a P for perception. Before I move on, some of you are gonna be a little bit cringy at reading some of these words. Judgment, I don't wanna appear judgmental, you may think. Feeling, I don't wanna be appearing too soft or if I think, does that mean I don't feel? So it's important to understand that um, the words that they chose to use when they developed the MBTI are not um, going by our traditional definitions or connotations of those words. So whatever we think those words mean to us right now, we need to put those aside because they're not the same meaning when it comes to the MBTI, okay? So the first preference pair is extroversion in or introversion. And so let's go through what this is. This is how we focus our energy. Do we focus our energy toward the outside world or are we more drawn to our inner world? So an E notifying extroversion would be drawn to outside world, whereas an I would be drawn to the inner world. Those who prefer extroversion prefer to communicate by talking. When they have a problem or a conflict or an idea, they, just, they like to seek people out and talk about them to others and work them out in a group setting or with another individual rather than on their own. Those who prefer extroversion tend to have many interests that they explore. So they appreciate a quantity of many interests and many pursuits rather than just a few. So they kind of dabble in a lot of different things. Maybe not too deeply in a lot of different things, but they enjoy dabbling and learning about different interests. They do best through discussion or through doing. And they tend to be sociable and expressive. When there is a work project or a relationship to be developed or a committee to join, they, all, they usually take initiative in joining those things pretty readily and even taking on a leadership role when they do join those things. For introverts, they are more drawn to their inner world. Instead of communicating by talking, someone who, with an introversion preference may prefer to communicate in writing instead. They tend to work out ideas by thinking and reflecting on them first, instead of by seeking out others and talking to others about those ideas. They have interests, but they prefer a quality of interest rather than a quantity, which means that they would want rather focus in depth on a few specific interests than dabble in a lot of different things. They may tend to be more private and contained. And when there's a committee or a group project, they may take initiative selectively only when something's very important to them instead of diving in and trying to be a leader in every situation. So that's where we focus our energy and you would write down E or I. One more example of that is that um, think about a part, think about when you go to a party or a social gathering. Sure, we all go like to do those things, whether we're extroverts or introverts, we all like to go to parties and go to social gatherings. But the key difference is how you feel after you go to that gathering. Do you, are you energized by it? Do you leave that talking about it energized? Or do you feel like I enjoyed it while I was there, but I'm drained now. I'm drained, I need some time alone. I need some time to reflect. And um, it, it kind of, it took the energy out of me rather than gave me more energy. It's not that you didn't enjoy it while it was, you were there, but it's the key is like, how did you feel after you went to that event? And so that would be the difference between extroversion and introversion. So now that I've described extroversion and introversion, please take a moment to write down which letter you think you are. And you can always pause the video if you wanna think about it a little bit more. So now we're gonna go on to 
sensing or intuition. This would be noted by an S or an N. Sensing or intuition is how we perceive the world and take in our information. So we all sort of perceive things differently and take in information in different ways. So those who have a sensing preference may be attuned to what's going on in the immediate and present situation. So they're in, they're in the moment and they're looking at what's going on right now. And they're oriented more towards the present reality. They tend to prefer facts over theories and understand things through practical day-to-day -day kind of applications. What they trust is their past experience and how, and they use those past experience to do their current duties or project or tasks or whatever it may be. Those with an intuition preference tend to look instead of at the present more towards the big picture, the future possibilities. And they are imaginative and verbally creative. They tend to follow hunches about, about what they're doing. So instead of the details and the facts, they kind of go off inspiration and hunches. They understand ideas and theories a little bit better, and they trust their inspiration and their future dreams more than their past experience. So they're more intuitive in that way. So this is a little bit more difficult for a lot of people to understand, so I'll try to give you a couple more examples. One is, say you're given a group project to do. So you're in a class and you're given a group project. There's some people who are very task driven and they're given a project and they immediately want to focus on, okay, who's doing what, what's this task? Let's dive in, what am I doing for this project? What exactly am I doing? What needs to get done, okay? So those, are, those would be more of a sensing preference. Those with an intuition preference will be given the group project and their immediate reaction is to think about what's this, the meaning of this group project in the big picture of the class? What are the learning object objectives? What are we going for here? And what is the overall goal of this project? What are we trying to get at? And they're gonna look at that first before, looking, before breaking down the tasks and the details of that. So whereas an S might be, what am I doing for this project? An N might be, what is the overall goal of this project? Another example is when you're looking to purchase a new cell phone. Those with a sensing preference may take that manual and read through every component of it and look at every feature of that cell phone. Whereas one with an intuition preference may just kind of just take, take it as a whole and say like, this one just feels right to me. I just have a feeling this is the right phone. I don't need to necessarily look at every single bit of the, um, the, the uh, instruction packet on this phone. I just feel like this is the right phone for me. And here's another example if you're having trouble deciding if you're an S or an N. So when you see this painting, what do you see? Take a moment to think about what you see here. So when I do this exercise live, those with an S preference tend to say, well, I see clocks and I see a desert and I see a tree. So they're kind of looking at the facts of what they see in, in this painting. Whereas those with an N preference might look more theoretically at this and try to interpret it. So they may say, I see time melting. I see the passage of time. Or they may see something else about the meaning behind this picture. So now that I've described S and N, sensing or intuition, please take out your pencil or pen and write down if you think you are an S or if you think you are an N. Now let's move on to the third preference pair and that's called thinking or feeling. And this is how we evaluate or make our decisions in our lives. And again, I don't want you to think that because if you chose thinking that you're not, you don't feel. And if you choose feeling that you don't think. So again, we have to set aside what our preconceived notions of these terms are and understand that they have different meaning when it comes to taking the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So those that have a thinking preference tend to be a little bit more analog, and I'm sorry, analytical and logical. They can appear to be more tough-minded. 
And whereas both thinkers and feelers want to be fair, they have a different perception of what is fair. So a thinking type may think that fair means that everybody is treated equally no matter what, meaning rules are rules and they should be applied equally to everybody involved. Thinkers tend to be, seem a little bit more reasonable and they use cause and effect reasoning from an organizational perspective. So how does what we're doing help the organization? How does it help the club I belong to? How does it help the class? How does it help my work environment? How does it help our group project? Okay, so how is this good for our project? How is this good for the organization? How is this good for where I work? However, those with the feeling preference indicated by an F tend to be viewed as more empathetic and they're, they're more guided, instead of guided by logic, they're guided by social values. They may appear to be more tender-hearted in nature. And they are going to look at how decisions that are made affect the people involved. Whereas both types want, want um, both sides of the pair want things to be fair Fair to someone who has a feeling preference is, has a different meaning than fair to someone of a thinking preference. So fair to someone of a feeling preference is more, they want everybody to be treated as an individual. So there are individual exceptions to rules are rules. They more strive for understanding, harmony, and positive interactions. When they're approaching a group project or um, leading a club, they're going to look at the people involved. Who does this help? So rather than that, they're looking at the health of the people and how the people are impacted rather than how the organization as a whole is impacted. And there's no right or wrong. And we need both feeling types and thinking types to make our organizations run, to make our social lives work for us. We need that in our lives. And we all could be either one at some point, but which one is more natural for you? Which one's more natural? So one example of that may be if you're in class and you have a syllabus and the syllabus says after two absences, your grade is dropped for the course. Okay. And so you may say, um, you may have the perspective that that's my rule and it's on the syllabus and rules are rules and there's no exceptions. So that would be someone who has more of a thinking preference. Someone who has more of a feeling preference may, if a student approaches them and says, I had an extenuating circumstance, God forbid a death in the family or something like that, someone with a feeling preference may say, okay, I will bend the rule this time, you have a lot on your plate, you can, you're allowed three absences and that's going to be okay for you. So they think that there are exceptions to the rule based on individual circumstances. So that would be the T or the F. So take a moment to write down which preference pair you think you are thinking or feeling. Okay, we're three quarters of the way through verifying our MBTI type. The final preference pair is judging or perceiving. Again, we don't want to assume that the word judging means judgmental as it does not. It is not what the MBTI is getting at when they use the word judging. So judging or perceiving would be marked by a J or a P, and it's the way we live our daily lives. So how do we live out the last three preference pairs? How do we act on these things? So those with a J preference tend to be quite scheduled in their daily lives. So this is, these are the types that are going to have to-do lists, and they're going to mark things off their to-do lists. They tend to be very organized in their lives and systematic in their approach to job tasks and group projects and schoolwork and um, anything really, even party planning or social life planning or planning out their weekend. They tend to be very methodical in their approach to how they live their daily lives. And they like to have things decided. They are planners and they like to have things also decided. They don't like open-ended, they like things done. Also, they tend to avoid having um, incomplete projects. So when they start a project, they like to finish everything that they start. They don't, it kind of drives them crazy when something's loose and open-ended. And they get really nervous and stressed out by saving something to the last minute. It causes them an immense amount of stress and they prefer to get things done ahead of time. 
Whereas those with a perceiving preference tend to be a little bit more laid back about their approach on life. They're spontaneous and more flexible. They don't necessarily make plans. They're more casual about it. And you can kind of keep it open-ended. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. They're okay with things changing. So they're flexible when things need to be changed at the last minute. They actually enjoy that. And saving, saving work into the last minute to them, they find energizing and they actually do better when they save things toward the end. And it's almost energizing to get things done at the last minute. So my favorite example of judging or perceiving is how we approach perhaps a vacation. So um, if those who know me know I talk about Disney World quite a bit. And so how would a judging preference or perceiving preference approach a trip to Walt Disney World? So one with a judging preference will probably have it very planned out. So a seven day trip, they know that they're going to Magic Kingdom on Monday and Epcot on Tuesday and Hollywood Studios on Wednesday. They have all their dining figured out and their fast pass is all set. So when you go on the trip, everything is organized and set. They follow a routine. That might drive someone with a perceiving type a little crazy. So someone with a perceiving type may say, that's not a vacation when it's all planned out. I prefer to just keep it loose and open-ended. We'll go to this dining establishment and if it's not open, no problem. We'll go to another one. When we, we'll wake up when we wake up and we'll go to whatever park we kind of feel like going to that day. So they don't like things as routine and scheduled. They like to kind of keep things open-ended and that makes them happy on vacation. So imagine that you, you know, you have different people in your lives that you've gone on vacations with or had or made weekend plans with. And sometimes we have a struggle to understand each other. Sometimes we struggle like, why didn't you make this plan? Or why are you so hung up on making a plan? And that's sometimes where we have conflicts in our lives and our social interactions. So understanding where people are coming through through MBTI, this window into others, helps us to not only understand them and, um, and cause less conflict, but it actually may make us appreciate those differences. So take a moment before we move on to the slide and write down if you think you're a J or a P preference. Okay, so now that you've done that, you should have four letters written down. And so that's step one called verifying your type or finding your best fit type before you actually take the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the physical or the, the, um, the virtual remote web-based exam. So before we move on and we finish up um, this webinar, I want you to know that the two middle letters that you guys came up with is the heart of your type. And the outside letters actually feed into that. So the inner part is the heart of who you are, the middle two letters. And then the other sides, whether it's extrovert or introversion or judging or perceiving, um, help to, um, to, for us to understand or to play out this heart of our type. So how do we live out our heart of type? Whether it's through outward energy or inward energy, whether it's through organization or being laid back and flexible. So the heart of type would be either ST, SF, NT, or NF. Sensing thinking, sensing feeling, intuition thinking, or intuition feeling. So those with an ST preference are gonna be focused on getting things right. So in a work environment, they may be concerned with the systems and the um, what's best for the organization and how to get things right on a daily basis. So they're very good at the daily tasks at hand and how to get those things just right. And so this chart, and you can pause this if you'd like, because I'm not gonna read every segment of it, but if you wanna pause it and read more aspects about what that type is. Those who have SF at their middle letters are concerned with making others happy. So they're concerned about the well-being of others in their daily lives. So they want to take care of people and, and help them with what needs to be helped during that specific time, during the here and now. Those who have an NT preference, intuition and thinking, are looking towards the future of an organization. So they may be designing systems and finding ways to make things better in the organization as a whole. And finally, those with an NF preference are concerned with others and the future of others. So they may be concerned with empowering others to be the best versions of themselves, whether it's through mentorship or through teaching, they wanna help empower others to become their best selves. And so that's the heart of who they are. And the outside preferences kind of show how they live that throughout their daily lives. 
So you have gotten through to the end of verifying type and you're one step closer to the big reveal. So you probably have four letters written down and you can find yourself in this chart of 16 different personality types. However, that's not the end of it. So the next step in the process of understanding who your MBT, what your MBTI type is, is to actually take the web version of the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, and then you'll receive results. And those results may differ from what your verified type is today. So that's where you have to read about both types and figure out what's the best fit for who you really are. So thank you for attending today's Myers-Briggs Type Indicator Workshop. And I look forward to you finding out what your personality profile is via taking the actual MBTI instrument.